Thank you very much. Good morning. I need to move. I can't stand. I learned that when I was out in the field uh, for 20-something years, like many of you. And somewhat standing up here on the stage, I feel like back in the UN. I feel like back in those days, I was up and you're down. And there's a barrier in between, of, in between and there's a distance. So usually I like to go down to be on the same level with people. But it's not possible, there's no space. But if I do that, then the cameras can't follow. So I'm forced to stay up here. And somewhat it feels very uncomfortable. So that's where innovation starts. Rethinking our relationships. This is all about relationships, relationships in the world, relationships between those who are out there. There's seven and something billion of us, and how do we relate to each other? Something extraordinary has happened over the last, I would say, 24 months. Especially for all of us who have been out there risking our lives in saving lives. Trying to change something and trying to get this message across into the world that somewhat there are needs which are uncovered. There are situations out there where we don't feel that the world is paying enough attention. And something has happened in these 24 months which nobody could believe would come true one day. The whole world is thinking about <coughs> refugees, displaced people, migration, is suddenly talking about humanitarian aid, is talking about development aid, about sharing resources. Who did it? Not us. It's the people who actually risked their lives, who came across the Mediterranean, many died, and incredible difficulties, incredible risks, incredible money they spent. And in fact, they achieved what all the public relations and media departments of all the aid agencies of the world never managed. They got it across. So suddenly, suddenly wherever you go, people discuss it. It also woke up something which, of course, we need to get nervous about. That's the ghosts of the past. That's the populist um, and fascist uh, statements we read every day somewhere. It also, uh, of course, showed us the limits of the European peace project. That's what, how Europe started once upon a time. Um, it showed us that somewhat we are not as advanced as we thought, that the so well um, equipped and trained and educated West, Europe is far behind, in fact. And there's something else, and that's where we're coming to actually our theme here. There's something else which definitely, definitely exposed the limits of what all of us have been trying to do and been doing for decades since we invented the modern form of charity, of helping, of being out there. Somewhat, it's not that the system is broke, as my former boss, uh, Antonio Guterres, kept, keeps on saying. But the system somewhat is clearly broken. It was always broken somewhat, but we simply didn't see it. And that's where we're now beginning to, to re have to rethink. That's where we start of, uh, the theme of innovation. Innovation is not about technology. Innovation is about re-changing our relationships. Innovation is about the way of how we finally move away eventually from the colonial past which is unfortunately a capitalist present. We're still there where we were before. We're still playing SimCity and getting little ships with resources from all over the world to us. The, the ones who are living in prosperity have access to whatever the world can. So the question is, how do we turn it around? Again, organizations like MSF being everywhere being at the forefront, the United Nations agencies, the many, many other aid uh, organizations in the, what we call it now, the aid industry, are covering only a tiny, tiny little bit of all of this. Let's be honest. 
how many of the 120, 130 million people in direct need of something, of survival, besides the one billion people also who have gone hungry yesterday, today, and will go hungry tomorrow, how much of this the traditional aid is actually covering? So we need, to be, we need to be honest with ourselves. We cannot do it. We cannot achieve that. We assist everybody out there who is somewhat in need. So that means we have to change the way. We have to change the way of how we look at it. How do we multiply our capacities? And the answer is, for me, pretty simple. It's not our capacities, it's the people capacities. Getting away from that arrogance we have as organizations, as people who come and help. I was also in that feeling before when I had that impression I was bringing something to other people. It's really the famous, the famous help people to help themselves. And are we really doing that? Honestly, I haven't seen it. I have been most of my time, not always, but most of my time really in the deep field. I have not seen a lot of initiatives, a lot of projects, a lot of um, true attempts to have people really take over. And that's something we need to really address. And there we come to connectivity. Connectivity of what the world can do. That's what I said to myself when I quit the United Nations back um, in 2014 is, well, it can't be that me as a field manager, I haven't seen anything of what the world can do reaching us. Reaching us somewhat, reaching people in, in the field. All these, what we call today innovation technologies, new systems, with the exception of having less people in the field because there are more people dealing with something behind, writing reports, more transparency, more accountability, um, analyzing data, which don't help me because in the field I have to make decisions on four or five factors on the spot. It doesn't help me to go in too much into detail. It helps maybe others to plan better, but I haven't seen as a UNHCR manager anything of this coming in. I haven't seen any, anybody I was working with really capable of taking over once I had gone. So how can we actually move to that stage of what I would say are the resources of the world, the knowledge of the world, that what people can do, what we have invented, what we can share so that others have access to this. We are benefiting from the fact that it's very easy to grab our phone and we have relatively good connectivity. We have Wi-Fi's, we have uh, whatever. And if you have a question, you put the question to Google. Or we have a question, we put the question to a network we know. Other people don't have that access. Are we really true about giving that access? So for me, the first demand in here is let's try to have really everybody in the world have that access. Let's turn around our rejection. We all have that feeling about globalization and connectivity as being something bad. But it's very easy to say, if you have access. Everybody here in this room has mobility, has access to technology, has access to knowledge. And it's very arrogant to say, other people down there, we have to protect them against that, against that, against that globalization, against that mobility, against all of these evils of modern society. The world has gone too far that we can stop it. So now it's up to us to turn globalization, connectivity to the advantage of the people out there. You have done a lot, the little I've seen of the work on um, the medical field particularly, to make that happen. But it is still not enough. It is still in the hands of a few. So the democracy of knowledge, socializing knowledge, that's what we are here for and should be here for. That's where innovation starts. The rest, yes, these are, these are gadgets, they're inventions. There we can find a lot of things, and, but that is not what I would call the true 
the true innovation. The way of how we accept, again, that we have limits, limits in what we can do, finding the ways of transferring responsibilities back to the people who are really the most concerned everywhere in the world, that is what we need to work on. And it's possible. There are many examples where, in fact, when we were not there, somebody else has taken over. I don't want to praise the private sector, but the private sector has capacities, has resources, has a lot of knowledge. Public sector, capacities you have in municipalities, in local governments. This is all something you need to make sure it travels. And it doesn't travel only between London, Paris, and maybe, if you're lucky, Mumbai or Rio. This also belongs to the hook, to Mafrak in Northern Jordan. This knowledge belongs to the small places where we all work, there where the stuff is happening. That's where we need to make sure that somebody realizes I can do something. That's what we do. That's what we're trying to do right now in Northern Iraq. I give an example here. Northern Iraq has one and a half million displaced people and refugees in a population of four and a half million people. Is the answer, is the answer with the humanitarian agencies? Is the answer out there to actually use humanitarian resources? No, it's actually with in supporting the local communities to actually understand that they can deal with an, a larger population in, in a different way. It is with, in fact, for us to lobby for others to come in. And I know that is the difficult part. That's what we're very bad at. People themselves have learned that, in many cases, waiting for the aid agencies is maybe not the right thing. But then they're left alone. That's also something I'm coming back to, my experiences in Zatari camp, which really taught me to become more humble, because that was one of the examples where people took over. When I was asked in 2013 to take over uh, Zatari refugee camp, which was a mess, some journalists called it the hellhole of, uh, of refugee camps, and was really violent, was really not pleasant. In fact, what had happened was an, uh, was an upheaval of the people against the aid agencies and against the way of how we were dealing with this. They wanted to be treated as people, as human beings, and they didn't want to be like we are now, us up and them down. They took over, they reorganized our site planning, they dismantled 86 buildings because they didn't want to go to the toilet together with 50 other people, as we had decided. They did not want to eat the same stuff. They wanted to be treated like normal human beings. They wanted to transform that camp, not into a better camp, but into a city, into a living space. And we were holding back. We were trying to prevent them. We called it illegal. We called it criminal. We got people arrested when they did that. That's how we think about them and us. So that's what I think we need to rethink. So for instance, let's take that example of refugee camps. Who should take and manage situations where you have 500,000 people, a million people into an area? Some go into camps, others are in villages. I don't think it should be UNHCR. I don't think it should be UNDP taking over from UNHCR. When we talk about the UN, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be the aid agencies. We should be talking about developing the whole area. And there again, a combination of protecting the rights of people. That's our job. Making sure that everybody has access, but have infrastructure and services being delivered by those who know that better. And that's again, capacities from the private and from the public sector. Academia, universities can contribute a lot. The world has an answer for everything. Before we go into discussions, I would like to show you a little clip. That's a clip from Zatari Refugee Camp from 2013. BBC Business Report 
one year after that recamp was established, was established on the 29th of July 2012, <coughs> the BBC business report came to a refugee camp. You wonder why, but first, the clip, please. The refugee camp is staggering. Kilometers from east to west, so big it's now considered Jordan's fifth largest city. And to illustrate its size, back down on the ground, a complete loop of the camp's outer ring road takes more than 20 minutes by car. And inside the camp, the number of residents has grown from a few hundred to about 120,000 people. And where there's that kind of population growth, commerce quickly follows. So this is Zatari's main business street. It's home to hundreds of shops and services. And it's so popular with Syrians and camp workers, it's been nicknamed the Champs-Élysées in reference to the bustling shopping street in the French capital, Paris. A walk along the street reveals a brisk trade in anything from mobile phone SIM cards, cigarettes, gas refills and electrical appliances. But aside from the sale of goods, services play an important part in creating a sense of normality in the camp. The owner of this business quit his beauty salon in Dara, Syria and moved to Zatari last year. The shop generates a small profit by offering haircuts at a one and a half dollar fixed price. But running a camp business is wraught with contradictions. I'm worried about lost opportunities and if I'm making the right decisions. For example, I look around me and think, should I renovate the place and expand it? And then I think, why? You're going back. Some people say the camp was better in the old days when they used to distribute meals. But I think that now is better. We can open our own shops. And the fact that this is possible is good for us. Now we're living like anyone else. And there's no better way of illustrating that point than having a look round Ates wedding dress hire shop, a hot spot for brides to be. Women used to come here, say they have weddings and they can't find dresses. So we got two dresses for rent and it worked out well. We have two weddings a day and there are people who come from outside the camp to rent dresses because it's cheaper here. The profit is not that much, but we are doing okay. Sometimes we even take five dinars from people who can't afford to pay much. But while formal businesses thrive, so too does Zatari's black market. District gangs are known to make a handsome profit by selling on aid goods and siphoning off electricity supplies. The man tasked with tackling this issue is camp manager Killian Kleinschmidt. That's the live chicken market here. A walk around the camp reveals how his policy of encouraging business development is having a harmonizing effect. Hello. But sometimes, and in the interest of maintaining peace, even he has to turn a blind eye to the camp's more questionable business deals. Back in Mr. Kleinschmidt's meeting room, and you can't help but notice this. The interactive map once used to explain his camp strategy to US Secretary of State John Kerry. In short, district councils need to be introduced to improve law and order. We need to bring in control, manage it, but also give the freedom for people to develop their businesses and develop their capacities, develop their homes. So that's why we, as we speak, trying to put in place physical compounds, physical administration, divide the whole place into 12 districts, which allows us to actually know who is there, what they're doing, and help them to doing their things in a better way, in a more regulated way, but also in, in a free way. That's what free market economy is about. So economic theory as a way of bringing about calm and stability. But keeping the peace in a camp is not always that straightforward. At the end of a long, hot day, tempers can fray. Tear gas used by Jordanian security to disperse a frustrated crowd. A reminder that Zatri Champs-Élysées is far from its French namesake when it comes to doing business. One demonstration and one act of violence amongst bigger groups since 2014, April. 
not one demonstration. Because we, we changed our relationship. They are, we were building a camp, they were building a city. Just to conclude, um, now there, uh, there is the Jordan Compact, which has been announced in London during the, London, the Syria conference. And one of the projects is actually to bring forward special economic development zones in northern Jordan, where Syrians and Jordanians should be able to work alike. That is not the job of UNHCR, UNDP, MSF, or anybody else. That's not the job of professionals to make sure, professionals in, this, in the business sector, to make sure that there is actually investment, that there is actually, um, of course, the protection of labor rights, that out of that still quite flimsy settlement becomes a real city, and that people can actually build up the future of their lives. That, for me, is innovation. Thank you.